ancient Roman surgical practices. Heavily influenced by Greek medical knowledge, advanced significantly during the Roman Empire. Renowned Roman physicians like Galen and Celsus, through their seminal works such as De Medicina, provided comprehensive accounts of various surgical techniques that are remarkably modern in their scope. These techniques span a wide array of procedures, including oral and cosmetic surgery, the use of sutures and ligatures for wound closures, and many more. Despite these advancements, surgery in ancient Rome was considered a last resort due to the high risk of infection and the absence of effective anesthesia, which made surgical procedures exceedingly painful and often fatal. The bravery and necessity required to undergo surgery in these ancient times cannot be overstated, with many procedures being undertaken only in life-threatening circumstances. Hello everyone and welcome to the channel. If you're coming back, it's good to see you. And if you're brand new here, it's good to meet you. I'm the ASMR historian, doing exactly what I should be doing. And today's topic is surgery in ancient Rome. A rather gruesome and macabre topic indeed. But one that no doubt my audience will enjoy listening to. Relax now. Sit back. Or busy yourself with a meaningful task. Let's get started on our video for today. The Roman surgical toolkit was sophisticated and specialized, including instruments recognizable to modern physicians today. These tools included specula for internal examinations, catheters for draining fluids, enemas for cleansing, bone levers and osteotomes for handling bone fractures, and many, many more, some extremely advanced for their time. After all, this was the Roman Empire. This extensive array of instruments enabled Roman surgeons to perform complex procedures with a degree of precision that would not be surpassed for many centuries. Roman medical and surgical practices were significantly influenced by Greek knowledge, a testament to the cultural exchange between these ancient civilizations. Many Roman surgeons were, in fact, of Greek origin, having their training done in Greece, bringing with them advanced medical techniques and knowledge. In the second century AD, Galen, a Greek physician working in Rome, played a pivotal role in advancing Roman surgical practices by amalgamating Greek and Roman medical knowledge. His contributions laid the foundational principles that would influence medicine for centuries. Aulus Cornelius Celsus, a Roman encyclopedist, made significant contributions to medical literature with his work De Medicina. This text covered a wide range of surgical operations, including, you may be surprised, tonsillectomies and even cataract surgery, showcasing the breadth of Roman surgical practice. Soranus of Epiphus, another influential figure introduced technologies such as the birthing chair, 
which does exactly what it sounds like it should do, highlighting the innovation in Roman medical technology, especially in the field of obstetrics. The allure of success and wealth drew many surgeons to ancient Rome, the New York City of its day that all the foreigners wanted to come to to seek their fortune. Well, the many different medical professionals from all over the known world created a competitive and diverse medical landscape. Of course, the education varied, with some doctors learning through private courses, family members, or self-teaching. Often in the famed city of Alexandria, quite known for its medical knowledge. However, this openness also led to the prevalence of charlatans and malpractice, as there weren't any strict regulations, or really regulations at all, on who could practice medicine. This lack of oversight made the public quite weary of doctors. Even though higher quality surgeons were available, but you know how it is, they were busy serving the upper classes of people. Now back to Celsus. His description of the ideal surgeon emphasizes not only technical skill, but also the importance of empathy and compassion, qualities that are still valued in modern medicine. Of course, you had to be very empathetic and compassionate while you were tying your patient down to the chair, making sure he couldn't thrash around too much while you cut his tonsils out definitely requires a steady hand and nerves of steel, of course. Well, despite these advanced perspectives, surgery in ancient Rome was obviously fraught with danger, largely due to that effective absence of anesthesia and of antiseptics making not only the surgery very dangerous, but often the recovery was even more fraught with danger. Think about the infections, and imagine the smell. Consequently, surgical procedures were often limited to treating superficial lacerations or performing amputations. That being said, ugh, an amputation without any anesthesia. Yeah, I think I'd rather just uh, take the self-checkout line, if that was what I had to do. This historical overview of Roman medical practices reveals a complex interplay between innovation and tradition, advancement and risk highlighting the enduring legacy of ancient medical knowledge in the shaping of medicine in the future. Now, question for you. What is a surgeon without his tools? Of course, there was a plethora of tools that the ancient Roman surgeons had in their arsenal. So let's talk about a few of them. What did they actually have? Was it just a big knife and something to cauterize the wound? Well, let's find out. The surgical practices were complex and varied, employing a wide range of specialized instruments to treat different medical conditions. From simple lacerations to intricate procedures, even involving the skull and bones. 
cupping vessels. These were essential tools in Roman surgery, used for creating suction on the skin to draw out pus, blood and harmful substances from the body. Made from bronze or animal horns, these devices facilitated bloodletting and other healing practices by applying heat to generate suction before placing them over an infected area. Chisels and Raspatories Utilized in bone surgeries, chisels were instrumental procedures on teeth and bones, including amputations and even neurosurgery. And may I remind you that's more of the skull variety of neurosurgery, not rewiring people's brains. Raspatories with their blade fixed at a right angle to a shaft were used to scrape bones clean of any diseased tissue or to prepare them for healing, showcasing the Romans' advanced understanding of skeletal anatomy. Drills and Levers Surgical drills designed with mechanisms to prevent excessive penetration, were critical for operations involving the skull, such as removing diseased bone portions or foreign objects lodged within them. Bone levers, resembling modern-day pry tools, were used for aligning fractures and even extracting teeth illustrating the Romans' precision in handling bone injuries. If you think the dentist is scary in 2024, try doing it in 24. Sores and trephines. Of course, sores allowed surgeons to take the direct approach and cut through bone particularly for amputating limbs infected by gangrene, while trephines, circular sores, were specifically designed for cranial surgeries, demonstrating the Romans' capabilities to address complex injuries. Forceps In various forms, forceps were versatile tools in the Roman surgical kit. Bone forceps were employed to remove small bone fragments, while specialized forceps like tumor volsulums and pharyngeal forceps were used for removing tumors and foreign objects from the body respectively. The development of forceps for specific purposes such as extracting teeth or removing polyps from the nose, highlights the nuanced understanding of different surgical needs. Scalpels With detachable steel blades and intricately designed handles, scalpels were used for a wide range of surgical procedures from amputations to the removal of polyps, highlighting the precision already developed in these times. Specular Used in gynecological and rectal examinations, specular were made from materials like silver and designed to dilate bodily openings for examination. Here's an interesting one. The Spoon of Diocles. This specialized instrument, designed for removing arrowheads specifically, demonstrates the Roman surgeons' need to think on their feet for specific injuries. Indeed, the design is rather interesting. Catheters. 
used for treating urinary tract issues. Catheters were adapted to the patient's gender and size, indicating a personalized approach. Strigils Commonly used for bodily hygiene, particularly by adults, athletes rather, strigils were designed to scrape off dirt and sweat. Now you may not think that this is a medical tool, but it showcases the connection that the Romans had made between dirt and getting sick. Of course, they didn't know about things like germs and bacteria, but I think they had some idea of keeping yourself clean would generally lead to less medical issues. Of course, the last thing that was in the doctor's toolkit was knives and needles, typically used for excising tumors, performing lithotomies, and treating various other conditions. Indeed, there was a large group of tools in the bag of the Roman physician. Now, if you're not already cringing from all of this, we're going to go on and talk about some of the techniques involved within uh, the ancient Roman medicinal practice. So, please bear with me and have a strong stomach. I'm first going to begin with saying that some words I will have to omit because of YouTube, you know. Let us begin first with fetus removal. In ancient Rome, fetus removal was a complex and risky procedure, often avoided in favor of less invasive methods. The majority of fetus removals were carried out using herbal remedies or drugs, which were preferred due to the high risk associated with surgical intervention. When a surgery was necessary, it involved penetrating the uterus with surgical instruments, obviously a very dangerous procedure that frequently resulted in death of both the child and the mother. Soranus of Ephesus, a prominent physician of the era, documented several methods for inducing fetus removal, including purging, heavy lifting, and the introduction of olive oil into the uterus. These practices highlight the lengths to which Roman women might go to to terminate, reflecting the limited options available and the significant risks involved. Amputation was a drastic but necessary treatment for gangrene, showcasing the Romans' willingness to undertake severe measures to protect their life. Surgeons employed tools like blunt dissectors for exposing vessels during various medicinal procedures, not just amputations. These instruments were also used in treatments for headaches and ophthalmia, indicating a sophisticated understanding of surgical techniques and anatomy. Procedures often began with preparatory steps, such as shaving the patient's hair and applying a warm headband to the neck, followed by detailed planning including marking vessels with ink. Surgeons and their assistants would then perform the incisions and use hooks and dissectors to expose the vessels, demonstrating a methodical approach to the surgery. Oh, and uh, when I say assistants, well, you needed two of them to hold the person down 
while you are sawing their leg off. Very easy to get second thoughts once the blade begins to penetrate the skin. Well, slightly less invasive is bloodletting, which is also known as phlebotomy for those trivia people. It was pretty prevalent in ancient Rome, and it was utilized to balance the humors in the body, a concept integral to Roman medical theories, going back to Galenic medicine. Surgeons employed a specialized tool called the phlebotome, or catias, for making precise incisions to release blood from a specific part of the body, believing that this could relieve various ailments or diseases. Alternative methods for drawing blood included using heated cloths to induce bleeding through the mouth or applying leeches directly to the skin. Ear scoops could also be employed to obstruct blood flow in a vein, facilitating the controlled release of blood with a phlebotome. Well, as bad as it sounds, I think I would be opting for the leech option. That's not as bad. Next one, of course, is the caesarean section a surgical procedure to deliver a child through incisions in the abdomen or the uterus. It was known in ancient Rome, but rarely performed due to the obvious high risk of mortality for the mother. This operation was most of the time conducted posthumously to save the child in cases where the mother had just died during childbirth. The mythological origin of the god Aesclepius and the historical account of Julius Caesar's birth through Caesarian sections highlighted the cultural significance of this procedure in the Roman society through the historical accuracy of Caesar's birth method. Well, that's still a subject of debate. Cataract surgery in ancient Rome, which is as horrifying as it sounds, was documented as early as 29 CE. It involved the removal of cataracts to restore vision. Celsus provided a detailed description of the procedure, which included using a needle to push the cataract beneath the pupil. The surgical technique required great skill and precision, with the surgeon operating on the left eye with their right hand and vice versa. Post-op care was also just as critical, involving the application of soothing medicaments and a strict regimen of water intake and abstaining from solid food to reduce inflammation. Now this actually showcases a remarkable understanding of post-surgical care and the importance of patient recovery. So the Roman surgeons get a few points for that one. These surgical practices demonstrate the advanced medical knowledge and techniques developed in ancient Rome and they reflect a sophisticated approach to healthcare and surgery that considered both the procedural and aftercare aspects essential for patient treatment. So where did they get all these ideas from? Well, they didn't just make them up themselves. It's part of a very long tradition. The foundation of modern cosmetic surgery can be traced back to the advanced medical practices of the ancient Greco-Roman world, 
where surgeons demonstrated remarkable skill in repairing facial injuries and deformities. Now, Roman medical texts, particularly the aforementioned De Medicina by Celsus, detail sophisticated techniques for rhinoplasty. That's nose reconstruction, by the way which involved grafting tissue to repair or reshape the nose. Such early accounts of reconstructive surgery highlight the historical depth of human attempts to restore physical appearance and function. Of course, you weren't putting your hand up for an elective cosmetic surgery back then like we do in our modern day. Once again, it was always a last resort. What about treatment for burns? Of course, the great fire of Rome happened. Maybe you'd have a lot of customers from that one. Well, treatment for burns in ancient Rome utilized natural remedies, such as vinegar, ashes, cork, bran, or honey reflecting a deep understanding of the healing properties of these substances. Now, I don't know about the vinegar, or the ashes, the cork, or the bran, but I will jump in and say that honey, raw honey, the one you get from the old man who lives on the corner, who has beehives of his own, now that is very, very useful. If you ever have some rash on your skin, honey can act as a antibacterial agent, albeit rather sticky. If you do have chapped lips as well, you can also apply some honey. Just try not to lick it off before it works. Now, skin grafting techniques were also employed to treat severe burns and other skin injuries. This certainly marks the early endeavors into the complex field of tissue repair and even transplantation. Galen, another towering figure in Roman medicine, alongside Celsus, described methods for cheek reconstruction to address facial traumas. The work of these two men lays a foundational understanding of facial anatomy and surgical restoration, principles that continue to underpin modern plastic surgery, albeit nowadays we know quite a lot more. Now, if you were any Roman man or a Greek man who liked going to the gym, perhaps you would find yourself with a hernia. Not a very good condition at all. Perhaps you need to lift weights that are more to your specific skillty. But you could take a visit to the doctor. Hernia repairs in ancient Rome were conducted with a combination of surgical intervention and mechanical devices, like trusses and bandages. Techniques varied from making incisions in the scrotum for direct repair to using compression methods to reduce hernia size. And in more severe cases, castration was considered a viable treatment Although I'm guessing that most people would uh, just cross their fingers and hope it would fix itself. The Romans also developed specific approaches for treating umbilical hernias, employing methods to manipulate the hernia back into the abdominal cavity before securing it, demonstrating an innovative approach to abdominal surgery. Yeah, I'll take the uh, second one. Thank you. Lithotomy. That's the surgical removal of bladder stones. 
was another area of Roman surgical expertise. The procedure was ideally performed on younger patients due to the anatomical challenges presented by the mature prostate. Surgical techniques included making incisions through the bladder to the perineum and using specialized tools to extract the stones. Well, that sure shows a lot of Roman ability to address complex urological conditions. And believe it or not, they even had some forms of neurosurgery, albeit it was just for treating skull fractures. And they did that with the aim of minimizing bone removal, as suggested by Celsus in De Medicina, or perhaps elevating and removing fragments as Galen advocated. The use of drills, chisels, and trepans to relieve cranial pressure and treat headaches evidences the Romans' pioneering efforts in neurosurgery. So think about it, you get a bump on the head, a fracture, or perhaps even a terrible break of the skull. They could fix it for you. If you dared. So, all of these historical surgical practices, they're pretty impressive for the time, don't you think? It illustrates the Romans' significant contributions to the evolution of medicine, and it laid the groundwork for many techniques and principles that continue to influence modern surgery. And by groundwork, I mean they were certainly on the ground floor of medicine. But hey, you've got to start somewhere, don't you? Well, in ancient Rome, the field of dentistry, much like other medical practices, wasn't really distinctly separated into the specialized professions that we see today. There wasn't anything like a dentist you would go to. You would just go to the doctor, the general practitioner. It is possible that dental procedures were performed just by medical practitioners or indeed specialists who might have also practiced in related fields, such as barbary. Tooth extraction, a common dental procedure, required a very delicate and careful approach to minimize the inherent risks. The practice involved techniques such as gently rocking the tooth back and forth until it could be removed by hand, or making incisions in the gum and bone to facilitate extraction. I can see you cringing in your chair just as I talk about it. Celsus, a notable medical writer, advised on the careful extraction of teeth, emphasized the importance of preserving the surrounding bone, and recommending against the extraction of children's teeth, unless necessary for the growth of adult teeth. Now beyond dentistry, ancient Roman surgeons employed a variety of techniques and substances to manage pain and treat various medical conditions. Dioscorides, for example, utilize mandragora, or ficinarum, as an anesthetic, while other substances like opium, henbane, wine, belladonna, and alcohol were used for their analgesic properties. Treatment of anal fistulas involved the insertion of probes through the anus with a linen thread 
used to encircle and tighten around the skin near the fistula, facilitating the healing. Surgeons developed sophisticated methods for handling abdominal injuries, such as suturing the large intestine and managing care of the protruding intestines in stab wound victims. This included examining the intestine's color and general condition, hydrating them if necessary, and ensuring the wound was wide enough for safe reinsertion and suturing. Projectile removal, you know, when you get shot by an arrow, and abscess treatment were other areas of Roman surgical expertise. Surgeons would begin by enlarging the wound to remove projectiles with forceps and make linear incisions to drain abscesses, followed by disinfection with honey. See, I told you the honey was the way to go. Of course, you would have to just hope that the infection would not come after this, and unfortunately, most of the time it would, meaning that you went through the entire procedure, the painful and horrific event, the worst afternoon of your life, only to be taken out by a staph infection some weeks later. Bad luck. Now the use of tongue depressors, or spatholomies, for managing oral abscesses and the strategic opening of abscesses with probes or specialized knives further demonstrates the Romans' advanced approach to surgery and patient care. These practices once again reflect a comprehensive medical knowledge. Not bad for the people of the time, but with a lot to learn. So there you have it. Will you be running off to the ancient Roman doctor anytime soon, listener? Perhaps you would rather try and wait it out and see if things would get better for you. But take some reflection on all of this. Think about how parts of the world that were not so advanced by the time how they would deal with things. Places that barely had the concept of a doctor or medical knowledge. Perhaps it would have been even more gruesome for these people. And think about our modern day. Do you think perhaps that there is things that we are doing right now in the medical sphere that in 100 years time 500 years' time, we will look back and think, how were we so ignorant? Often I think of diseases like cancer, which no doubt many of us have been touched by. This horrible, insidious disease that cuts so many lives short. We must subject people to this chemotherapy for a chance at survival. A therapy that quite often feels like it's dragging people through hell, making people just as sick. For the chance that they may live another few years before the cancer simply comes back, just as malevolent as it was before. Do you think, perhaps, in years' time, we will look back upon this the same way we look at lobotomies? What will we learn to deal with these insidious diseases that will make what we view in our modern age as so normal and necessary as so backward and barbaric? Among all of the horrors that the future may hold for us, perhaps there's a light and a hope. 
in terms of the medical advancements. Of course, we'll have to make sure that the medicine companies aren't holding anything back for the sake of their profits. But once again, what will we find out in a hundred years' time? Thanks again for watching, everybody. On that note, I will wish you all the best in whatever struggle you are facing. It's been good. And I'll see you in the next video. Good night, everybody.